What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, what got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, what got you there with got you got you? Brian, what welcome. Got what got you, you there? How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, this is a, a tremendous honor for me being in Southwest Florida, watching the success you've been able to build. But I want to dive back to the origin story a bit. What were you like as a kid? Did you have that entrepreneurial spirit? Well, I, I was very fortunate that I grew up in a, a home where my dad was, my family was involved in small business. So I watched small business from a very, very young age. As a matter of fact, um, when I was in high school, my dad helped my younger brother and I uh, own our first business. We owned a coin-operated laundromat that taught us about working in the very beginning. And, and in the end, that actually paid for both mine and my younger brother's way through college. So from a very young age, I kind of learned about being in business watching him, first of all, and then getting the opportunity that he get, gave us. How did that even start with the coin-operated business? Well, my dad was in the dry cleaning business and owned a strip plaza, and it, he decided to break one part of it off to make it a coin-operated laundry back, I don't even want to say when, but uh, he thought it would be a good learning lesson for us to you know, take care of the machines and go every day and clean the place up and making sure everything's in order and actually taking the money out and counting it and doing all the things that you do in a coin-operated business. So from probably my sophomore year in high school all the way through when I actually went off to college, we ran up that small business. I always try to learn through osmosis, even these conversations. I'm, I'm learning from you. What do you take away from your dad, just seeing him operate that business day in, day out? Well, there were several things that he taught me at a, a very young age, and, and uh, unfortunately, um, he passed at, at, a, at a young age. But what it was all about was hard work and perseverance. I remember from when my some of my first memories, uh, he would get up and, and, and be open our business up at 7 o'clock in the morning and work till 7 o'clock at night, five days a week. And then Saturday was a short day. He only worked till 3. So five and a half days a week, he was just putting in tremendous hours. And he, he I would watch him and he would always be there himself because that's how he knew that things were running well. Now, that business didn't grow into a very large business, but it just it just continued to feed our families and provide a very nice uh, lifestyle. So it was about customer service, being uh, knowing your customers, and uh, perseverance and hard work. It seems like those values have remained and instilled in you and the companies you've built, huh? Yeah, I, I, I don't know that there's any uh, shortcut. I, I wish I could say I figured out a way to uh, you know call in work running a company. I, I've not figured that out. I don't know that's even possible. So I still, even though mm, there's others who are in charge of day-to-day -day operations, I still show up here every morning around 7 o'clock in the morning and stay till later in the day. If you, I, I just guess you, if you want to lead and you want something to grow and you want to become of it, it, it's often good to set the right example. And if I don't show up for work, how, why would I think everybody else would? Yeah, no, I mean, lead from the top. I'm really intrigued about the young, younger years, though. And what do you, what do you think you were going to end up doing? Obviously, you had that entrepreneurial mindset. You know, it's it's it, it's funny that you ask that because I often do reflect on this. I never in my wildest imaginations ever dreamed that what we started and what, what the life we led would become the life we have. I'm, I, I, I pinch myself every day in, in knowing that, you know, we've turned it into today we employ over 200 people. I, I, did, I could never have scripted what, what happened. I'm very, very proud and happy and excited and, and, and passionate about what happened. But, you know, you just get up every morning and you, you really try to do the best job you can and, and, and try to lead a, a great life. And it's amazing what can happen. But to, when I was going to high school and college, I was I was going at a time when the Vietnam War was on and all kinds of things were going on, which um, didn't give me a great feeling of, of future success. But then and we tried several businesses before we got to this business to, that didn't work. And then so then eventually we found a business that worked. But you learn um you know, when you do good things, good things happen. And obviously the converse of this is true. If you do bad things, bad things happen. And, and who has time for that? So we just got up and, and swung the bat every day and, and, and see how hard we could hit the ball. And then you found 
that you, if you surround yourself with great people, then your life becomes easier. And you, and the only way they become they, they're going to be great people is if you treat them that way. And so you really just get better at. Um, you know, being involved with people and helping people grow their lives and letting them lead. Probably the, the best thing that I could do is is get out of the way of, of a lot of people who do run this business. But if if you had met me 30 years ago and said, uh, you know, you're going to run this big company and you grow it into one of the biggest companies in Southwest Florida, I would think that you probably had too much wine or something. <laughs> so it, it really, you know, and I don't know that Many people, I, I don't know, I, I know, I didn't start out with the idea. Well, we're going to build a big company. We just start out and, and try to do the right thing. And 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 in the beginning, and we'll maybe get to it. But you know, in the beginning, it wasn't. Uh, uh, we were struggling. We struggled for a lot of years before it started to gain some momentum and gain some rhythm. Uh, and then it worked. But to say that I scripted this whole thing from early ages is is not just not true. Now. Curious part of the whole thing is that the school I went to was a very big um, school about fabrics and technology, and it was in the uh, in Massachusetts where the uh, mills, the, uh, the the textile mills were. And my parents um, were both in the garment industry when they were young, but then I ended up in the fabric industry and, and using fabric as a hurricane protection device, which is almost a thousand percent co- coincidental, but it's just kind of funny how it all worked out. Uh, my college was, is, and was one of the biggest textile universities in the United States, but I was no part of that. I was in the business school. I started out in engineering school, but I transferred to a business program and it was just all about business and, and, uh, and then it, I didn't really have the passion to really own my own business in the very beginning. But as time moved on, you just start to think you have better ways of doing things. And, you know, working for yourself, I thought, was more fun than working for somebody else. And if you're going to be in a leadership role, why not be in the real leadership role? And that's kind of how we got in business. It was, a, you know, why run a company for somebody else your whole life when you can have a chance to run it for yourself? Yeah, a lot of threads I really want to dive into. But one thing I'm curious, you mentioned we had a few businesses that failed. Sure. Any you remember? Oh, many, many. I've been around the construction business my whole life. So we uh, we started out in a, being in the masonry business and the stucco business, um, and that kind of rose and fall with the economy and new construction. Um, I was a carpenter in a, in, a, in a rough framer for a long time when we were in the construction business. We built houses um, for uh, quite a few years, and then with the economy changing, um, you know, you run through cycles. And, and so... I, I love to build a house. It's There's nothing that maybe gives you more pride than taking a piece of earth and then building something that somebody lives and their families live in. And, you know, we developed a whole streets and, and that was just really exciting. But your some of the variables are beyond your control. Like all of a sudden, the uh, in our case, the uh, mortgage business went through the roof and what used to be maybe a 5 or 6% mortgage, I remember, went up to 18%. And people simply couldn't afford houses at that time. The economy shifted and, uh, and it, just didn't, it just didn't work out. But you learn things and, and, and hopefully if you do things right, every time a business fails, it's not really a failure. You're just another learning experience. Yeah, I'm really intrigued by that. You, you learn from the failures. What was your mindset like during those times? Did you think you'd eventually be successful with those? I – you know, sometimes necessity is the uh, is the mother of invention, and I I, I just knew that f- real failure wasn't an option. And and just I mean, you, you just have to get up the next day, and, and the sun comes out again, and, and you try again. And and it, and I don't know that it's a failure if long as you learn something, and and long as you nobody gets hurt when things close down. Um, so yeah, that business didn't continue. I don't know that I would I would uh, call it a failure uh, because I did learn what I didn't want to do the next time. I did learn more about you know financing and cash management, employees, and all the things that you you learn along the way that are necessary to run a successful business. So although those businesses didn't continue, we did our best to make sure nobody was harmed when when things went the wrong way. But um, but I but if you learn something 
then I think then it is still a success in, in some ways. Yeah, maybe we, we shouldn't use failure, maybe growth opportunity or something like that. <laughs> I'm really intrigued. You mentioned a few things about cash management. Anything you wish you would spend a little bit more time on when you were younger? Oh, I, I think in when you run a business, the thing that they should probably spend a lot more time on in college and education is psychology. A big part of being in any kind of business, success or or not success, is about people. And the better you ha- are at understanding what motivates people, what helps people to grow and, and, and just be better, is a lot about psychology. Um, the nuts and bolts of the mechanics of cash management, that's, that's kind of just cut and dry. But the whole, I believe the whole trick to running a business is getting people to want to do what you want them to do. So I don't know that they ever teach you enough in school about psychology. This is something I never imagined we were going to talk about, something I'm actually fascinated by. If there's someone young listening to this and you talk about psychology, how can they go further on this topic? Well, I'm not sure that I'm the expert at it, but truly it's about personal relationships. It's about motivating people. It's about treating people correctly. Um, Those are probably the necessary components. As businesses evolve, most times when you start out, you start out with it just being you doing most of the things. But that's not scalable. And so in order to become scalable, you have to have others to have that same dream. So what you, my secret is you have to be clear in creating that dream and that vision and that passion of where you want to go. And the better you get at telling that story, the better you can get at having people follow you down that road. And that's really one of the tricks to building a bigger business is to get more and more people to be singing the same song. It's interesting. Came here a few minutes early. I just saw you how, how you interacted with the employees. And every single time it was almost you were highlighting them. And it, it just. I- well, you know, you, 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 you learn a lot of things as you keep doing this whole thing. And then, you know, um, it, nobody really cares what you get done. It, it, I, I don't really care if I get the credit as long as the results are what we need. And I know that the stronger I can have, the stronger people I can have on my team, the stronger my team becomes. So by um, making sure that everybody knows that they're certainly appreciated, uh, they feel more free to do, make their decisions. Sometimes in business, people are intimidated. Some people have a, a style of management, which is managing by intimidation. I find that to just be counterproductive. You want people to make decisions. You want people to do, to just to go and not be worried about what's going to happen next. I mean, obviously you have to make sure that you keep everybody in somewhat in check, but you want people to, to, to be themselves and do more. If they're, they're worried and scared that if every decision they make, their head's going to get chopped off, they won't make decisions and your company won't grow. Here, we, we really have a, a, a culture that kind of helps things out. And that is, if you work for StormSmart and you make any decision with the idea that you're trying to meet or exceed a customer's expectations, you'll never get in trouble. You simply won't. Our goal is we have a zero tolerance to bad customer service. So we want everybody to be able to make decisions on their own. I can't possibly make all the decisions that are here every day. And when people make decisions, if you make 100 decisions a day, they're not all going to be right. It's just humanly impossible. We're all humans. But if you make all of your decisions with the customer in mind, the best interest of the customer in mind, we'll be a successful company. Now, there may be some things that we have to correct along the way so that we don't – it doesn't match where we want to go, and, and but we're not going to chop your head off to do that. We just kind of go through more training. But we want our people to feel free about making decisions as long as the idea is to do the right thing and have the customer's expectations in mind. We want them to do that. Now, that only happens 
when they have confidence in what they're doing. And that only happens when they make decisions right or wrong and their heads don't get chopped off. It's remarkable when you start to empower people, what can come out of them. You mentioned confidence a minute ago. How's your confidence? How, how has it been throughout your career? Is it any different now than it was early? You know, yeah. Uh, as you as you gain momentum and you gain strides and you gain market share, you certainly drink the uh, tea a little bit more. So when you're first starting out, you're on kind of thinner ice and you're, you're a little tentative about the decisions you make. I by nature, wasn't a super, uh, uh, you know, confident person. I, I don't know that I was ever an inconfident person, but I was, I, I certainly wasn't as confident as I am today. But when you see things go in the right direction and when you talk to people and you see success, it just has a natural effect of making you more confident. So I'm a pretty confident person today because I, we've been doing this for 25 years now, and we have grown it into a very uh, one of the largest companies in Southwest Florida. And with confidence, you feel freer to make decisions, and that usually means you make better decisions. Now, again, if you make 100 decisions a day, they're not all going to be right, but you must have the wisdom to say, mm, that wasn't really good, so now what do we – don't make that mistake again. What do we do next? I, I think often the only bad decision is really no decision. And that's so many people just don't make decisions. But once you start going and you and you start making a series of, of good moves, you just naturally become more confident. Yeah, one of my ethos is momentum breeds momentum. Those little wins compile right. on top of each other. I'm really intrigued, though, as you sustain that success for a long time and the decisions you have to make, how do you avoid some of those major errors where you believe in your confidence too much? Well, you you know you, you really first of all you surround yourself with great people and you don't stick your neck way out all by yourself. And usually, I'm I'm very very blessed. I have a, a team. A, a, the inner circle of our company is a team of a lot of I believe extremely intelligent people. So we make. I very rarely make a decision without having bounced it off the people that that are closest to me, and usually they're they're pretty honest with me. I mean, they don't I don't think they treat me with kid gloves or anything like that. Uh, and you don't, as a leader, you don't want to have a circle of people who are just yes people because then you do make bigger mistakes. But generally speaking, if you have a group of three five people that you make decisions with, the odds of making a really bad decision are, are pretty small. Uh, so, and then, well, then we don't make big decisions quick. We, we, you have to make decisions. That's my job to make decisions every day. But the bigger decisions, we, we really try to think about and, and look at the pros and cons and look at the risk that's connected with it and make sure that the reward is, is, is far bigger than the risk you're taking. And, and move in that fashion. Uh, you just, we employ today over 200 people, and I take paying those people and employing those people and, and the welfare of those people extremely serious. So I always try to make those decisions with that in mind. I also believe that, again, if you do good things, good things happen. So we make decisions that are just fundamentally correct. It's it's not that difficult. We there's the you know the right side of the fence, the wrong side of the fence, and then there's the middle of the fence. We all know what's right and wrong, and you just don't do things that are wrong. And 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 so you if you're doing things that are right, you generally don't get in that big of trouble. Now sometimes you don't have all the information that you might need to make a decision, and in hindsight, I would have made a different decision if I knew everything I knew then. But if you're if you're clear about the decisions you're making, and you're making them out of the of, of what is the best for the people concerned, for some kind of great reason, it, generally those decisions turn out pretty good. You mentioned feedback, and I'm always interested how business leaders are able to surround themselves and get the necessary feedback because you mentioned earlier, at times, people can be afraid of higher-ups. So then how do you get them to be honest and truthful? You know, I, 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 it's, it's almost kind of funny, the, the 
four or five people who are, are in my closest circle seem don't seem to be too worried about telling me what I write <laughs> right or wrong, and, and and it's and it's really really healthy that way. So you have to create that culture. If you're a, a tyrant and you're you know when somebody doesn't agree with you, you you know you bring out a hammer. That's probably not going to encourage future communication. Here today, um, especially within my inner circle, the they they know their job and in, 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 in their in their they're professionals. So they know they're confident in what they do as well, and they know that they I encourage them to say what they think. I mean, if if you just only listen to yourself, you might be getting bad advice. But if you listen to three or four other people who who are are fundamentally in line with you, you're probably going to make good decisions. And then you try to keep them close to you. you know, the three or four people that um, are closest to us, to me, have been with us for a, a long period of time. It, it's not a, a new relationship. That doesn't mean others don't come in and out at times. But you you try to find people who share common values. Yeah, I think people is probably going to be my biggest takeaway from this conversation. It's, it's a reoccurring theme thus far. I'm really intrigued, though. One of Inc. 500's fastest growing companies, tens of millions of dollars, 200 plus employees. Let's go back. Origin story. How does StormSmart even start? You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, what happened was I was in the garage door business in a small way uh, before Hurricane Andrew. And I had always read a, a lot of different books and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, there was this storm. It became Hurricane Andrew, and it was heading towards southwest Florida. And I had read how Home Depot did some of its logistics, and that when a storm was coming to a certain area or likely to impact a certain area, they would already have trucks deployed towards that area, staying out of harm's way, but so that they could have inventory as quickly as they, they could. So Hurricane Andrew hit southeast Florida, and um, we ended up having inventory almost the next day. And I realized that the next thing you needed was people, and we figured out a way through a, like a fax blast, because in those days there wasn't email and those things there, and we um, sent out a, a fax to other overhead door companies throughout the United States to try to gain um, labor. And so we got involved in the rebuilding of Southeast Florida, the homestead, my South Miami area, um, right at the very, very beginning. And, and we w- ended up putting up, putting out, 5,000 garage doors uh, during the next 18 months. We, we That Hurricane Andrew hit, happened on August 24th. We worked every single day, seven days a week from August 24th till Thanksgiving. I, it was the first day I took off. And I learned how to um, deal with a disaster. And, and and it wasn't all successful because what there were there were a lot of lessons we learned. Like, yeah, you could write all the business you needed, you wanted to write, but and a lot of money came through the door. But all of a sudden, you took a very small company and blew it up a hundredfold. And then after eighteen months, you looked around and said, you know, we ran through all this money, but how much money do we have? Because you bought new equipment, you you were just spending money as quick as you can because you were trying to mobilize and and and, and, and attack as fast as you could. But sometimes that growth wasn't controlled, and we and we spent a lot of money. But during that storm, I realized that the garage door. And in, in, in those days, because of the code, was the largest opening on most houses in Florida. But it also was the lowest win-rated opening on the house. So what was the largest opening was the weakest opening. And in my opinion, what happened in southwest, southeast Florida was during Andrew, that garage door was the largest opening house, the weakest opening house, started getting hit with roof tiles and all these things. And, and all of a sudden, it started buffeting that garage door. So it started oscillating and then eventually failed. And so it just opened up this the biggest opening on your house. In those days, 
The attic access was in the garage on most houses, and it was simply just an inlaid piece of sheetrock or plywood. And so all of a sudden, this huge gust of air and pressure went into the garage and blew that attic access off and caused that pressure to increase in the attic and, and just blew them the roof right off the house or moved it around. And then the house started to fail. So we realized that the, oh, oh, the biggest opening in the house was the weakest opening, and if, but if you could protect that opening – all of a sudden you were protecting the biggest opening in the house. So because of my relationship with looking at the doors and being a structural person, we developed, I developed a system, it was called a garage door bracing system that we pioneered and invented. And it took that weakest opening and made it one of the strongest openings. And that was really the first product we brought to market. And we eventually sold it through Home Depot and, 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 it, it, and it took off. So that was the first product we brought to market. But when I watched all the problems with Hurricane Andrew and all the awful things that happened to people when their houses were destroyed and they were living in tents and trailers and it was and, and just being displaced overnight by one storm and just changing their lives, we just I just kind of knew there was a must be a better way of protecting homes than what we were doing. And and then all of a sudden, we started thinking, okay, fabric. Bulletproof vests were made of fabric. And we thought, well, if you could make a vest strong enough to stop a bullet, why couldn't you use it to protect against hurricanes? And so we contacted the uh, people at DuPont who made Kevlar, which is the basic material of, of a bulletproof vest. And we started talking to them about our idea. And uh, they seemed to listen. So we started working with several of the engineers from DuPont and uh, then their mill that they made the Kevlar and it was called a place called Clark Schwabel who actually weaved the material that made the Kevlar and we started testing products to try to develop a new kind of hurricane protection. At that time the only code about hurricanes was the Miami-Dade code and it was all about protecting the glass and when you took a fabric and put it in front of a piece of glass, it had a lot of flux to it. So it would continue to break the glass. And the only way you could make it work was by building it way away from the glass, which didn't wasn't very attractive in most applications. And and then Clark Schwabel was spending a lot of money. DuPont was spending a lot of money. And they started wanting to uh, recapture their money. And they were really, really proud of their Kevlar. And, and, it, and it didn't so... It almost didn't work from a uh, price model for what we were trying to do with it. So we kind of backed away from it for a little while. Then as time moved on, Florida started developing its own building code, which is the floor, which today is the Florida building code. And their engineers said, you know what? It's really not about protecting the glass. It's about protecting the envelope of the house. If you can keep the envelope intact regardless of whether the glass breaks or not, your house's chance of surviving a major storm are dramatically increased. Well, that opened the door to flexible products. And you didn't have to build this tent way away from your window. It allowed a, a system to be used that even if the glass broke, as long as the envelope of the house stayed within tack, you could, that would qualify as hurricane protection. And that was the whole theory of the new Florida building code. It was one of the theories of the new building code. So it allowed flexible products. So then I was, we were raising a child at a point and I noticed that she was on a trampoline and I noticed her bouncing up and down and it, and it could hold her weight and it was outdoors and it stayed out in the sun. It didn't have a UV issue. We thought, hmm, if it could hold me or her on a trampoline, what would it do if we tested it with a missile flying at it and all those things there? So we took what basically was t trampoline material and brought it to the testing lab and tried to test it out, and it worked almost perfectly. And that's how we first started developing Stormcatcher. It's so interesting. You mentioned just, just seeing the trampoline. I was I was going to ask this question five minutes ago when you're just talking about the idea generation and your ability to conceptualize. Maybe if I use this material here, have you always been that creative? You know, I, I'm I, I, I I've been very very fortunate. Um, you know, you 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 just have this little thing that 
beeps in your ear and says, well, what if you tried this and, and you try it? And then, you know, once you start developing, the first product that we brought to market was by far the hardest product we brought to market. But after you get a little bit more successful, some of those barriers break down. And you have more confidence in doing what you're doing. And so, yeah, we, we, we've we kind of always, I've kind of always been, what, you know, this is meant for this, but what if you tried it that way and what would happen? And, and take that chance, just knowing that you just have to watch it. And if it starts going the wrong way, you got to, you got to bring it back. But you, if you don't take chances, your chance of getting across the finish line are probably small. So you're able to think long term. I'm always curious about the business leaders that are always just so busy in their business that they can't step back and think long term. How have you been able to do that over the past 25 years? Well, it, it's it didn't happen automatically. I can tell you that much. Um, you know, I, I'll tell you a, a short story. When when our company was just first started growing, um, I was doing everything. I, I remember I, I was working all day and speaking at night, and I was going through uh, two, at the time, the batteries, the cell phones weren't all that strong, and I would go through two and three cell phone batteries a day, and I, I was eating Rolaids like you wouldn't believe. And uh, a lot of the our marketing that we do involves us public speaking and, and, and telling our story and, and trying to teach people about the, uh, the value of protecting their homes. And I remember giving a speech one night, and uh, and this friend of mine happened to be giving. We kind of started doing speeches together each night, and he was watching me, and he said, "You know, Brian, you, you just got to slow down. You you you're you're not gonna, you can't go forever at the speed you're going at." He said, "You just really need to think about something different." And he said, "I'll tell you that my company, we hired another person to work with me, and things changed. So, so I." decided to take a chance with under his advice. And I hired, um, I took our best salesperson and said, this, once you come off the road and you come to work with me and you take over this part of the business and I'll take over that part of the business. And I was scared to death because he was, a, he was a fairly high priced salesperson. And all of a sudden I was doubling, really almost doubling our payroll. And that was very concerning because we weren't doing that well to start with. But I brought him inside, and we and he became our vice president after a short period of time, and our business never slowed down. It never ever it, his he more than made up for his the cost of his payroll, and we became scalable, and we just and we just kept growing from there. We've been very blessed that we've been picked by Inc. Magazine five different times as one of the fastest growing privately held companies in the United States. But me offering him a job in our company to to take a lot of the burden off of me so that I could work on my the things I was strong on and he could work on the things that he was strong on and I didn't have to make any decision, every decision, it just worked. And we we went off like a rocket ship and, and probably have never slowed down since then. Now, he's since retired, but when I did that, it, it showed me that by empowering others, that's the only way your business is really going to continue to grow. So I saw that, and, and then I saw that, you know, if you share common beliefs, you don't have to make every decision. And they're not going to make every decision the same way I would, and that's just something that you have to deal with. Now, if you have good communication skills with each other, they'll, you'll be able to get closer and closer to those decisions. But a long time ago, I figured out I wasn't the smartest person in this company. So a lot of times I learned a lot and they made others made better decisions. As you continue to grow, if you're inside the business, you can't see the outside. And so many of the decisions that you need to make in order to continue to be successful, you need to see from the outside because the old saying that you can't see the forest because of the trees is it's just so very, very true. And, and there's just a lot of cliches that we use that, that really just are how we run our business. And, and that's one of them. And so I figured out that if I step out and let these people – who are probably better at day-to-day -day operations or sales or marketing or or accounting, then then I could look at bigger picture things 
and see where we wanted to go. If my head's down all day long and I'm dealing with every day-to-day problem that comes down the path, there's no way I can see five years out or seven years out. And as your business grows, you need to see five years out or seven years out, or it'll come and whack you because time goes very, very quickly. And if you don't start planning ahead, it can really be a problem. Yeah, I'm thinking relinquishing control could be one of the most difficult things a business leader can do. So I'm wondering, once you take that step, relinquish some control, empower the people below you, how do you let them run and do their job? Well, you you first of all, you hopefully you pick the right person and people, but you you have to be okay with knowing that they're going to make different decisions than you might make. But again, if you have that culture of we'll make all decisions with the customer's best interest in mind, as long as those decisions are are in line with that, then then life goes on and and it's not bad. And and then you speak with each other and say, you know, I you you made that decision. Um I would have probably made this decision and talk to him. And then you find out that maybe there were things that they knew that you didn't know, or maybe they didn't know that you do know. And you you speak with them, you work with them. And you have to be approachable. You can't again they're not going to make these decisions all of them right out of the box correctly. So you just have to talk with each other and be professional and, and, and be open with each other so that they can learn more about what you're trying to do. If you're clear in your mission and you're clear in your direction, as time moves on, if you choose the right people, they'll start to make decisions in line with what you want to do. And you got to, if you build a strong enough company, unless they do something just tremendously wrong, you, you, you might be surprised how good it turns out. Yeah, let's run through a scenario here. You've got the right person in place. You know what they need to go do. You know most likely the correct answer. They don't know it yet. Do you let them make that mistake? Do, how do you prep someone for those things? Well, you know, it, it, it depends on what stage in the game you are, but sometimes the answer is yes. You know, you, you, you probably more often try to coach them a little bit without, without making the decision for them. You try to show them different scenarios that might lead them closer to the goal line. If you, if you cut their legs off and make that decision for them, they won't grow. So you've got to take that chance and you've got to believe in those people. And so you, you, you might make s- suggestions or encouragement or, or, or talk, but you want them to make that decision, right or wrong. And then if you know that it might be a close decision, that you, you, you keep them close so that if it starts to go the wrong way, you're able to help them swing it back. If you make decisions for the goodness of the customer and what's good for Southwest Florida, even a different answer than what you might have thought was the right answer might not be a wrong answer. It might turn out to be even better than you thought. And again, we're, we're here and, and, you know, the things that we won't do are, are, are just do anything wrong. And, is, and so as long as you're going on the right side of the road, um, you might be interesting how you get there. And so Yeah, I'm sitting here listening and it just it seems like a lot of higher level thinking and then just a lot of experience. I'm really fascinated by culture, how you continue to instill the value when you go from five employees, 10, 25, 50, over 200 now. How do you keep growing that culture with a growing uh, work base? The culture of a company, there's probably nothing more important than the culture of a company. It's, it's, it's just ultimately important. You, there's several ways that you do it. And one is you lead by example. I don't, I don't know how I can expect people who work for us and people to have a certain culture if I don't practice it. You know, doing the right thing, um, trying to make Southwest Florida a better place. It's th- those are the principles that we build our company on. So you first lead by example, and, and, you, and you never waver. I mean, I I can't say you do it this way, but I'm going to do it the shortcut. I mean, that that's just not the right way of doing it. And then you reinforce it. 
and you, and you get out there, and, and we do a lot of things that are um, in the public, and, and we do a lot of uh, civic things and all philanthropic things, so that we're out there, and we try to tell that story of how, why, and how we do it, and, and the reasons for it, and we try to, uh, you know, hang those carrots out there to, to try to do it. We here, we try to hire the greatest people we can hire. And then we try to make them greater. We do that through education. Um, the people at Storm Smart, if they want to go to school, whether it's online school or at one of the colleges or any of the schools around here, we'll pay for their education. I mean, there's certain requirements that have to be pre-approved and things like that. But we want our people to become greater because we know that the greater our people are, the greater our company is going to be. So we do everything in our power to make them greater. And then you take you, you treat people correctly and you try to make them better people and make them grow and, and create a safe environment and, and an environment that people want to be in. For all of us or most of us, we spend more waking hours here at work than we do doing anything else. Why would you want to spend that time in some place you don't like or that's miserable or it's unproductive or unhealthy? So one of the biggest jobs that I have that I take the most seriously is making sure that we create a safe environment here at Storm Tomorrow, a healthy environment. And I believe if you do that, then people will grow. And if you help them grow, they'll they'll naturally be loyal to us. We want people to sing the same song as we sing because that's what makes us better. Yeah, if you have 200 people and they're not all enjoying what they do day to day, it's going to be difficult to run a successful business. It's awful. It's awful. And and you and you do that by saying doing what you say. And and so when we when we make pledges to our people, when we say we're going to do something, do it. How do I how can I expect you to do what I ask you to do if I don't do what I say I'm going to do. It just doesn't work. And so we try to stay consistent and, and, and stay open. We also try to listen and so that we hear what they have to say because out of uh, the mouth of babes it comes a lot of wisdom. So. You, you mentioned leading by example. I think you might know where I'm going to go here. You do the continuing education, but yourself – here you are, and now you're getting your master's in entrepreneurship, correct? Well, a lot of people said I had to become smarter. <laughs> and and I, I was starting at it at such a low point. You know, as, as your business grows, if you don't continue to grow with it, I don't I don't know that that that, that you're gonna continue to grow. You you in order to get have your business grow, you must grow as well. One of the ways, one of the great ways of 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 growing is by learning more. So after being away from college for a lot of years, I decided about three years ago to go back and get my master's degree for a number of reasons. And one was that I here one of the problems you we have here at Storm Smart is a lot of us have been together for a long period of time and a lot of us have grown together. But in many cases this is the biggest company we ever worked for. And when you're a company of a certain size, you can do things in a certain way. As you grow, you can do it a little bit different way. But as you start approaching to be a bigger company, there are issues that things, we just don't know what we don't know. And so in order to solve that problem, I figured I would go get some more education. And so I got involved with my school back in Massachusetts and I spoke to them about, you know, trying to do an online training program, online education program. And they were very um, open to this discussion. So we, we, I started taking online courses back almost three years ago and this may I'll, I'll pray. I, I will eventually walk, but, a, but a couple of things. One is I, I needed, I had almost had to do it to, in order to continue to be able to make this company grow, I had to grow. But also, I have this, I've had the opportunity to, uh, mostly at FS, uh, FGCU, and go out and talk to some of the kids out there and, and, and share a little bit about the story of how we got here and sort of like we're doing right now. And, and, and you watch their faces. And, and it's just the most amazing night of your life. And you, you, if you 
You know, who cares how much you know if you don't know how much you care? And what good is knowing all this if you don't share it? So it's really fun to go out and tell a story. And if I can change just one person's life, if I can get them one more person interested in being a coming in an entrepreneur, home run. So someday when I don't work as, even as much as I'm working now here, I'd like to perhaps teach out at some university here. It happens to be FGCU, but maybe with online education, who knows where that is. Also, again, sharing our story, I'd like to probably, I'd like to get a shot at writing a book about what we've done here. And only that only comes when you have certain credentials and, and a master's would be one of them. Yeah, Brian, I feel like I'm getting a, a lesson today, which is why I love these conversations. Two things I really admired you for is, is, is your curiosity and then your growth mindset. And you mentioned reading early on. And I'm wondering, are there any books throughout the years that you just really enjoyed you learned from or maybe even other experiences you've just taken a lot away from? Uh, I, uh, I'm a huge I, – I, I, I love to learn. So I am constantly listening to podcasts. I'm constantly listening to audiobooks. Um, I could tell you that um, Jim Collins has written a series of books that I, I just think are amazing. And so I constantly to read them. I like reading about other um, entrepreneurs who have been successful and wrote. I uh, recently uh, listened to the guy, Howard Schultz. I recently did the Steve Jobs books and um, all those people that are, have led companies. I, I just I find them so interesting and such a learning experience. Yeah, it seems like you really have been able to learn continually throughout the years. And I'm just thinking now, looking forward, looking to the long-term success of StormSmart succession here, and then how do you pass this company on? How do you let it succeed even beyond you? Almost, well, I've been very fortunate. And since the story I told you earlier, I had a vice president who eventually retired. And I've had a couple other people um, who served as uh, vice presidents over the years. But we decided um, almost three, two and a half years ago now, um, I met a gentleman who actually was the uh, economic development director for Lee County at one point. And uh, he had an amazing pedigree and, and he was far more educated than I was. And we brought him in. I met with him and I was starting to share some of the uh, struggles because at that time we were, again, growing rapidly and we just couldn't hire enough people to fill all the positions. But yet we couldn't we couldn't catch up. We just couldn't catch up. And I spoke to him uh, on a number of occasions uh, about what we were doing. And he shared a lot of stuff about Lean and Six Sigma that that I wasn't all that familiar with. And so he came in as a consultant first and, and kind of looked at different things. And we got to know each other a little better and over the years. And so one thing led to another. Eventually, he became – we granted him the title of president and CEO – and he really runs the day-to-day -day operations of our company, and he takes more and more of the day-to-day -day stuff. And I, I stay more with the sales, still a little bit mostly the sales and marketing, but a higher end stuff with the idea that I'm, I'm, I'm backing away from the company daily routine, and he's taking more and more. We're two and a half years into this experiment, and and we're moving along. It was certainly further we were than a year ago. Um, so you you. But there's a lot to it because of some of the things we spoke about, the culture, the culture of our company is so important. Again, the nuts and bolts of business, you can kind of read about those. But the culture of a company and the DNA that makes up a company and the way you treat customers, the way you treat people and employees, that's something that you got to get right. And it's something that you probably don't read in a book. You got to kind of learn as you go and how you treat people. Those those are things that that we're working on that are that are what make us different. Today in in the world of automation and computers, you you can automate all kinds of systems, but we're in the custom customer business. And so we don't ever want to lose sight of, of of our dealings with our customers. I'm very, very proud that today and, and for a long, long time, 62% of the business we do here at StormSmart 
is because we did somebody's brother, sister, cousin, or mother. It's the referral-based business. And I believe that's the correct way of growing a business. And I'm very, very proud of that. But that only happens when you treat people right, meaning things. We have a saying, we started out with a saying, if, if you take care of your customers, your business will take care of you. And and that's another one of those cliches that just seems to be something we we, we, we believe in. But as you grow, you learn it a little differently and you say, you take care of your employees, your employees will take care of your customers, and your business will take care of you. So that's just a, 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 a fundamental building block that we have in our company that we, we believe in, we preach, we, we are. And, and those are things that you got you to gotta convey over time with your employees and, and with the leadership. You said 62% of the business is referral? Yes. That's unbelievable. I'm proud of that. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's just a testimony to the people we have here. You know, you know, if you have to buy new leads every day, your profit margin might get really, really thin. But if you do the right thing, people care and people will refer you. Our, we, we're, we're a marketing company. There's no doubt about it. But... The majority of our business comes because we did, we took care of you. We did what we said you're going to do. And why would you want to have a business that didn't? Very remarkable. I know you're always looking forward. I want to step back for a moment just to look back. 200 plus employees, tens of millions of dollars a year, one of the fastest growing companies. What is it like looking back over the past 25 years? I, I'll tell you a, a couple things, and, and I often reflect on this. I, I pinch myself on a regular basis because I can't believe it all happened. It, 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 I, I'm, I am so proud of the things we do. It, you know, it's almost surreal in, in a many ways because it has been 25 years or almost 25 years, which is a, a significant part of my life, but it has gone by so fast. And to use another cliche, if you love what you're doing, it really doesn't seem like work. I'm very, very proud of the people and the things we've accomplished and, and uh, what we can do to try to make South Florida a, a, a better place. And I, I pray that we get to be able to do that forever. Um, time goes very, very quickly. I mean, we're approaching the end of 2019. We're going to start another decade. It goes by very, very quickly, and especially when you're busy. You know, there's, there's, it's not been all good days. I mean, we first started out, we struggled a lot. We we didn't know who we were, what we were doing, and it took three or four years to start to get this momentum going. The last 10 or 12 years have been a rocket ship. I mean, ever since Hurricane Charlie hit the, uh, the Charlotte County area, um, I don't it, it's almost like a blur. We we just started growing. We were at 23 people when Hurricane Charlie hit here. And then all of a sudden, we went up to 100 people, and we just started growing ever since then. And, and then you, you're so busy growing and trying to make sure you're doing smart growth and staying ahead and, and developing new ideas and new products. It goes very, very quickly. Uh, if I was to sum it up, I, I mean, I'm, I, I would just say I'm extremely proud of what we've been able to accomplish. I, I'll tell you that it's certainly I'm not the one who deserves credit. It's the people that are here. And it's, it's been a, there's a bunch of people who've been here since the very beginning. And um, it's their hard work and their uh, putting up with me that uh, really makes the whole thing work. And, and so... You, I really have to give a lot of credit to those people. I, I, honestly, they're the ones doing the, the heavy lifting. I'm not sure there's a better place to end than circling back to the culture, the people. You continue to highlight them. It's an ethos of you, your company. Anywhere else you want the fans, the listeners checking out to, to find out more about yourself or Storm Smart? Well, yeah. I mean, we, we're certainly a digital company. I mean, we, we certainly have um, StormSmart.com and BrianRiss.com and, and our Facebook campaigns. Um, you know, we, we like to be out in the public. If you if you happen to be living in Southwest Florida, we're often at events. One of the things that I enjoy doing, we do is we're, we're I probably sit on the board of, I don't know, seven or eight different nonprofits to try to help them do it. So we're out in the community and we sponsored the fireworks in Cape Coral and in Port Charlotte. Uh, we, we just recently um, did the whole thing with the honor flight people and giving back to our veterans is a huge part of, of Storm Smart and what we stand for. Um, 
you can uh we like to be